that K33 is non planar. But we didn't like actually do it. We just kind of like started to do it. Agree? But I had like a kind of a, um, I had, I thought about this a little bit more deeply. So K33 is non planar. Um, the easy part of the proof is like the end. The hard part of the proof is convincing yourself that um, what we are, the, that the, that the uh, particular arrangements of points and lines that we're putting on the paper are in fact like the most general possible way of doing it. Does anyone need like a quick like recap of what the hell's going on? Or like not really? A little bit. A planar graph is one in which the, lot, the edges don't cross each other. And um, I'll say something else, which is what I also said last class, which is that really when we talk about the graph being planar or not planar, we have to be careful because the thing, uh, uh, the, 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 the edges crossing themselves is in fact not like the graph per se, but it's like the representation of the graph, which is called an embedding. So an embedding of a graph is a way of representing the graph um, on a, um, uh, in a two-dimensional way, such that vertices are represented as points, um, edges are represented as lines, uh, and a, on, a, on a flat two-dimensional Euclidean plane. And so this is an example uh, uh, of a non-planar uh, embedding. I'm just repeating myself from last class. You could be like, you could interject and be like, yeah, Rose, we got this! You don't need to say this again! You gotta laugh, yeah. everyone's gotta scream. Do you agree? Yeah. Or should yeah. I yeah. keep talking? Just give me like lots yeah. of feedback, yeah. Yeah. don't just stare yeah. at me blankly. Recall all that last time! Yeah, woo! Recall that last time we talked about how this is a, this is a, uh, a non-planar embedding, but there exists a planar embedding of this same graph. And so that we say that the graph is planar, if there exists a planar embedding, follow? Okay, so K33 certainly feels very um, non-planar, uh, and in fact, we did this last class with, um, the, I forgot who the houses were, but it was like Sophia, Shreya maybe? Yeah. And Emmanuel's houses, which we were trying to connect to the important resources, water, bacon, love, <laughs> and we couldn't do it. Um, and so it feels like K33 is non-planar. But what I want is like an absolute proof of this fact. Well, this sounds really, really hard because what I need to do is quantify over all possible embeddings. So I have to consider, in the most general case, every conceivable way there is to draw this, uh, this relationship. How do you feel? Okay, good. So what I'm now going to do is like, we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, let's the uh, vertex set B A, B, C, D, E, F. This is exactly what we did last time. So let A, B, and C be members of one set, and D, E, and F be members of the other. And what we will do, which is what we did last time as well, is uh, uh, sort of think of those as being maybe like colored or something like that. So A, B, and C are the houses, or if you're sticking with our old uh, way of doing it, A, B, and C are the uh, the male uh, what was it, ducks, frogs. frogs, and D, E, and F are the female frogs, and so this graph is bipartite because you know, duck, duck. What are they again? Frogs, frogs. frogs. Okay, good. Woo! All right. So here I shall do the following. Do you agree that which vertex I start with is totally arbitrary? So yes. yes. Woo! So I shall sort of drop into yeah, like. The void. Imagine there are the void. You're like God, right? It's like day zero of creation. Drop into the void A. Well, it's still just a void, man, but there's just like a point in it now, right? Okay, now drop into the void without loss of generality D. Well, A and D have an edge between them, and just there's that edge. But do you feel that this like segment is still just floating freely in the void? So continuing without loss of generality, I shall drop um, B into the void. Um, so there is uh, B. And it really doesn't matter where I put B, because the only thing that must be true is that B must uh, connect to D. So it's just like will, right? But this, now we have this sort of two-segment linkage 
just freely floating also out in the void. So that's like still a void man as far as I'm concerned. Okay, now, without loss of generality, take another uh, uh, point, um, uh, uh, E. Okay, and where do I put E? Well, maybe this is sort of obvious, or maybe it's not obvious, but like, everywhere is the same, man. Like, there is no, there is no anything, because it's just a segment floating out in the void. So I put an E, say here, just to be weird, right? If I put an E here, uh, well, now I have to connect E to A and B. And I like, do so. Okay, now it is day one. God has rested because we have separated yeah, I don't think that's the... Right. What? I don't think that... You don't get to rest until like day seven. Oh, that's true. Uh, <laughs> I forget the exact line that happens at the end of each day, but it's like, and he saw that it was good or something like that. Anyway, the point is that by... Once I pick two points from um, the, 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 the set of houses and two points from the set of um, Water, Bacon, Love, then um, now I have like a closed region. And it is completely arbitrary which two points from this set and which two points from this set I picked. But like now we have sort of uh, uh, now separated the light from the darkness, right? There are now two regions. There's a sort of inside region and an outside region. Okay, so this is the part of the proof that I skipped last time, which is that like that every, I'm gonna erase it because I wanna draw it like pretty, Every possible way of doing this is essentially just going to boil down to um, A, um, here I want to make these dots kind of small because I want to color them, A, um, D, uh, B, and uh, E. And they have to all be connected with edges. Okay, and now let's call this inside here region 1, and we call this inside, re and we call the outside region 2. So region one is the area enclosed within this square, and region two is like everything else. All right, from here on in, it's just casework. Just beautiful, beautiful uh, casework. Okay, so let's actually do it. We started to do it last time. But I, th I think there's like two cases, and then there's two cases within those cases. So I think I need to draw four of these. Um, so let me just do that right now. Cha, cha, uh, A, D, E, B, R1, R2. Uh, I think it's technically three cases within each of the two first, like, there's three subcases within each of the two cases, but two of them are really similar. Okay, good. So I think I think I can yeah. get by with this. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, I mean, you want me to do... Okay, uh, okay, you know, what the hell? If we're here, we might as well just do it all, right? Um, wait, we did turn the camera on also, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. All right, so this is case one, and this is case uh, two. Uh, I'm just gonna like add more like as needed because I'm not convinced. So let's just begin. All right, case one says it is time to add another vertex because of the total symmetry of the situation. It doesn't matter whether we add C or F. So let's just add C. And let me do my colorations, uh, which are that A and B are blue, um, and um, someone like jump up and help me like grab a blue marker and like. That's your rain. I'll usually just spend the whole class roaming around with the marker, just like kind of fixing things up and fixing my typos and adding like notes and stuff. Okay, good. And then, uh, good. And then he's going to make um, E and D uh, red and all that kind of stuff. All right, so we can now focus on what's going on next. And what's going on next is we need to add point, what did I say? C. Okay, where should we put point C? Well, um, we, uh, can I get some red? Um, can you so where can I put point C? Case one is that I'll put point C inside. All right, so if I put point C inside, uh, then here it is. And this is uh, this point right here is C. All right, well, if C is on the inside, then what uh, happens to C? Well, it's connected to uh, D and E, certainly. And so when I, yeah, make it really big, because in the video you can't see colors unless it's like, oh, okay. the marker's can't come off. All right, whatever. Um, so, uh, oh, and C is blue, um, so we go to blue, and then this blue is connected to both uh, E and D. So I connect and connect. Okay, but by connecting, I have now um, divided region one back up uh, into like sort of two regions, right? Can I call this, now can I call this like region 1A or something? And let's call this um, region 
uh, region 1B, or some crap like that. Okay, and now, uh, that's one possibility, right? And then, uh, now, I have to place point F. Well, where can point F go? Yeah, please do that. Mm -hmm. Region 2 or either the region 1 half. Yes, there are basically three options now for where we drop the fifth, the sixth point. The sixth point being F. Like, keep going, draw all the. Oh, you're getting, you're good. Oh, this is great. We should be doing this all semester. Um, there are six. Uh, there are three options for where we put the point F. Option one is point F goes in region one A. Option two, it goes in region one B. And option uh, three, it goes in 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 the outer region. Well, whatever you do, you're screwed. If you put the F here, then uh, now you have this red, um, and it has to connect to all three of the blues. But it can't. It can only connect to the blues A and C, which like are vertices of the region that it's like locked in. But F cannot get to B, and so I will draw a dotted purple line and a sad face, because S is getting no, um, no, uh, B is getting no love. Cool? Say cool. Cool, cool. Okay, then the other option, which is completely symmetrical, so much so that, that he was like, yeah, don't bother even doing it, but let's just do it, what the hell, is that we drop F in the other sub-region of region one. If we drop F here, uh, then uh, it's the exact same problem, right? I now have to connect this to this point F to all of the uh, members of ABC. So it goes to C, it goes to B, but it can't go to A. And so again, dotted line to A, sad face. And what is happening now is that um, Shreya is getting no love. Okay, and now, since F is always love, that's how it's going to end. And now, the third option from case one was the option that we put um, uh, F outside region two. Okay, so if we do that, so here's F, and now what happens? Well, uh, we have to again connect it to all of the blues, yeah, we can get to A, yeah, we can get to B, but we cannot get to C. And so now Emmanuel gets no love. Follow? Say follow. Follow. Woo! Okay. Um, so that's like sad. Okay, so we simply cannot place C in region one. End of case one. Good, say good. Good, now we go to case two! Case two. Where can is the other option to place point C? It's like outside uh, in region two. And so we put, um, jump back up here and fix it up. So now we put C outside, and now C is blue. Um, well, okay, now that C is outside, what am I supposed to do with this C? I'm supposed to connect it to the reds, which I can do. So connect and connect. But now, by connecting uh, C to E and C to D, I like complete a um, cycle or whatever, and now I have sort of partitioned what was called region two into two subregions. Are you following this? Region two A and region two B. Don't sit down. I just might as well just keep staying because I need you over and over again. So now, because you can just redraw that, yeah, yeah. what I've done so far. Um, so because this is this is the beginning of case two, and now. Um, he's going to finish up the picture, and now we're going to uh, finish up the proof by doing, once again, the last thing, which is where does F go, which is the love supply. Where do we place the love supply? Wherever we place the love supply, it will not make it to all three houses. What's one option? Region 1. Region 1 on the inside. Well, if I place love uh, inside the region, this not, video is not going to make any sense to anyone who didn't watch the previous video. Uh, is now uh, love uh, will flow to um, Shreya's house and um, Sophia's house, but it can't leave region one, so Emmanuel gets no love. 
Um, that's like sad. And then uh, region. Uh, then okay, cool. Say cool. Cool. Woo, Jenny, no sleeping. Uh, what's the other possibility for what we do with the last point F? Well, we can either put it in region 2B, this picture got a little crazy over here. We can put it in region 2B, or we can put it in region 2A, which is just like outside. And in both of those cases, we will again get a contradiction. Because now, if we place the love machine in region 2B, it will connect uh, just fine to B and to C. But it can't ever leave region 2B, and so it cannot get to A. And so what we have is uh, no way for Shriya to get love. Um, and if we place it uh, outside in region 2A, the outside outside, then we have to connect it to uh, A, B, and C. Well, thank you. We can connect it easily to C, so Emmanuel gets love. We can connect it easily to A, so um, Shriya gets love, uh, but Sophia now gets no love because this B is trapped inside the region 1, 2B sort of combo. Okay, so by a kind of like super generality um, and then a uh, six cases, we have now proven that you just can't freaking do it, man. Cool? You cannot place six points in the, what, what, what this is really is, is like a proof, what, what makes this sort of little part of graph theory so interesting is that it like transcends, I think I said this all last class, but I'll say it again, it transcends graph theory per se, and it is in fact some like hybrid field of like graph theory and geometry. So what I'm really making is like a geometry claim that one cannot place six points in the plane and connect them with six lines in such a way that the lines don't cross. Question? Wait, uh, like the two sets of cases are kind of the same, right? As soon as you place C outside of it, you can think of C as the B and make the B the C and then they're the same thing. Yeah, uh, yeah smart people will be tempted to just be like, Ugh, this, is all just, this, this is all just one case or some crap like that, but I felt it was worth it to just do them all out. But yeah, in fact, what you can especially do is like if you just think of, and we are going to think of it, if you think of the outside region as just like a region, and you think of the inside region as just like a region, like if you fully process that like the outside is just a region just like the inside is, then really there's just one case. Because placing C inside the square is no different than placing C outside the square. If you're sort of willing to sort of like invert inside to outside and outside to inside, it's really just still one case, right? There's nothing special about outside the square versus inside the square in a kind of a way, right? And so really once you finish case one, it applies to case two too because just take every point inside the square and put it out and every point outside and put it in and in fact your situation is perfectly symmetrical. Who was with me? I now have reached a deeper place of understanding because I have also been teaching this other class called advanced geometry which we do this thing called inversion where we like take things and we do and then it's like exactly this. Oh, right. What was I going to say? Also, oh, a couple of things that are far from obvious. Um, so, true or false? If a graph is planar, it is planar with like actual like lines connecting the points, like edges, like straight lines. Like not obvious, but true. Um, right. So, notice how we do all these little like curly, curly things. Can you imagine a um, sort of a, a, a magic uh, finger um, function that takes, and this thing goes, goes boop, and then all the points kind of just like move to different locations, but now it's only straight lines connecting them. I claim that can always be done. In other words, I claim you can always like uncurvy your lines and your curves and make them just like lines. Who is following what the hell I'm saying? Okay, good. So actually, though it might be, especially because it's like hard to predict, especially when you let a kid be in charge of things, it gets kind of ugly over here, right? But like, this could have been just done with straight line segments if I so desired. Okay, and the other thing that, usually I wait for this to come up organically, but I figure it's like now or never. Like, there's all, this proof relies on like some assumptions, which are extremely plausible, and which are themselves like, very, very deep bits of mathematics, such as like, read there are things called regions, 
which like divide the plane up and you can't cross them without like crossing them, man. So, those of you who took logic, which are three of the people in this room, are you pan over here? Um, those of you who took logic, you might recall that it was only towards like the very end of the 19th century that people started realizing that like if we want to give extremely rigorous proofs of our like obvious uh, geometric theorems, then uh, Euclid isn't good enough, and we need like some additional extremely low-level axioms which he does not address. And one of those axioms uh, is the so-called plane separation axiom, which says something which is very intuitive, which is that if you drop a line L into a plane then this line L divides this plane into two uh, regions called half planes. And that these half planes, that it really does divide them in, a set, in the sense that if you take a point uh, A in one half plane and a point B in another half plane, the sense in which line L divides the plane into two half planes is the sense that the line connecting A and B or you might say any curve whatsoever connecting A and B must cross through line L. So this is kind of a, a kind of like an, an existence uh, axiom that needs to be like built into the very concepts of geometry to make these things possible. Those of you who are in logic, can you nod along? Like yeah, yeah, we learned this. Good. That's like a thing. What? So we need like different ones because these are all segments. We need different ones because now we don't want just lines anymore, but we want like curves in general. And there are even more fancy, fancy people who have made even more fancy, fancy theorems that say things like, yo, imagine you have a closed curve in the plane, whatever that means, and it means exactly what you think it means, right? Then any closed curve C in the plane, um, this, is, this map is beyond my head personally, or beyond my experience, over my head, or I should say, uh, but a closed curve in the plane divides the plane into two regions. And it, the, the regions are divided in the sense that if you pick any point um, inside uh, the region and any point outside the region, then any continuous curve connecting A and B must like cross that region. Cool? Okay, so it's not it's just your imagination. These sort of uh, either assumptions or theorems, or however you want to think about them, are lurking in the background of all of this. And suddenly these have come to the fore, and we've left this like discrete world, uh, in a sense, because we are sort of combining discrete math with sort of, uh, uh, sort of a, a background geometry of the way planes work. Who's with me? You guys seem kind of bored, just because there's so few of you? Woo! What's up? Also like half plus one, sorry. Half of you, you feel like that was all explained in, in, in Logic? Yeah. yeah. Okay. This was, but I don't think we ever talked about this. This is like the Jordan curve theorem or some crap like that. I've seen that diagram. You've seen this diagram before? Yeah. Okay. Good. So good. A closed curve divides a region. All right. So uh, um, so there will be a there will be a, there will be a sense in which all of these theorems about um, planar embeddings will always be maybe especially if you're a serious rigor fetishist they will always be like a little bit. Um, less rigorous than you might hope for because we're just assuming all this background geometry. Um, Daniel Zhu last year, uh, upon my request, uh, looked into this a little bit and the conclusion that we came to was you just don't want to be more rigorous about this. And he, he did one of his Daniel Zhu things where he was just like, there's a reason why people don't do this. Um, that was my Daniel Zhu impression. Uh, and he sent me some like extremely uh, convoluted paper which attempted to like rigorously prove all these theorems about planar embeddings and it was like terrible. All right, um, behind you off camera is this proof being erased, which is fine because I think we're done with it. But did you, do you appreciate how hard that was? Say, yeah, Mr. Rose, it was really hard. Yeah. It was really hard proving simply that K33 was non-planar. Do you also appreciate how like with each additional point we try to add to the configuration, it will become like exponentially more harder, right? Because we'll have more and more cases, unless we're willing to like wave them off as being like all uh, you know symmetrical or something like that. Say so, yes. Good. Therefore, it would be really nice to like distill planarity down to some like essential concept, and that's what has been done by Kuratowski's theorem, which says, as I mentioned last class that there are like, this is my interpretation, which might be slightly inaccurate, there are really only like two um, non-planar uh, graphs, sort of, in a sense. There's K5, which is non-planar. Proof hasn't happened yet, but will happen. 
and K33, which is also non-planar. And I think, as we also mentioned last class, um, they are like minimally non-planar. We kind of said all this, right? Uh, in the sense that any subgraph of K5 is planar, and every subgraph of K33 is planar. Um, and the amazing theorem called Kuratowski's theorem, which we're not going to prove, and I'm probably not even going to spell it right, is, um, uh, and Gossett doesn't prove it either, uh, is the theorem that in every non-planar graph is hiding a K33 or K5 shape. All right, now, that's like a little bit weird. What do I mean by hiding a K33 or K5 shape? Well, okay, because this is like sort of geometry in a certain kind of sense, um, like if I have some, take K5, say, and let's say that this is a graph, and this graph is the friendships between five friends. Okay, but now, suppose some new thing happens. How am I going to do this? A new person moves to town. So this is A, B, C, V, and E. A new person moves to town now. This new person is called F. And this new person does two things. It decides, I want, it decides. He decides, this new person F, that he wants to be friends with A and C. And in order to capture A and C's friendship, he first must break the friendship between A and Z. And so <laughs> F comes in and, like, um, you know, Mean Girls style, um, erases that friendship and replaces it with a friendship of his own between A and between Z. Cool? Say cool. Okay, notice that this is a new graph. And if we care about, you know, graphs, because that's what graph theory is about, it's like a very, very different graph. It's like literally not K5 anymore. It's some new graph with six vertices, and it's certainly not complete. And it loses all the properties that K5 had, like it's not regular and all that kind of stuff. Give me, I need the vigorous head nods. Good. But from the perspective of like, is it planar, it's like the same damn graph. Do you agree? So the geometry hasn't changed or something like that of the configuration. Okay, so without giving the exactly right technical definition, because I'm not sure if what, the way Bassett phrases it is even like helpful, because it's kind of annoying, let's just call this graph that I've just drawn in K5 like the same, basically. Okay, and same, the same basically has a name. That name is homeomorphic. So we say that two graphs are homeomorphic if they are basically the, sh the same shape, give or take the sort of addition of these little extra points along the way that don't really do anything, okay? If you prefer, if you do not like this kind of high level way in which I'm talking about it, and you prefer the like details, you may read Gossip. What he does is he just goes through this thing called the elementary subdivision of an edge. And he defines, big surprise, the elementary subdivision of an edge to be the process by which that edge is dissolved and a new uh, configuration is achieved in which this is like edge prime and edge double prime. All right, for someone who wrote a graphic novel, I think you should do more happy talk about friendships. I think that would make it more clear. But anyway, that's exactly what I just said. And then he says, uh, two graphs are homeomorphic if both can be derived from a common ancestor using only a sequence of elementary subdivisions. That's a little bit more general, but I think it ultimately doesn't matter. What it means is, um, given any graph, oh, and also, that it, for the graph to be uh, non-planar, it doesn't mean that it has to be equal to K5 or K3, it just has to have a subgraph, which is homeomorphic to K33 or K5. And so basically, the big picture, not the most precise way of studying the theorem, but uh, never mind anyway, the big picture idea is, in any graph that's non-planar, there is a section of it, and by section of it I mean there is a subgraph, which that subgraph is basically uh, either K5 or K33, give or take these extra points that might exist along edges. Cool? Say cool. Okay, good. This is actually, has anyone seen Goodwill Hunting? The movie? No. It's not even a good movie. <laughs> uh, in, in the, like 10 points in the, find the homeomorphic 
crap. Yeah, I just but I just they watched it like a couple days ago. Uh, and I just can't it can't go in. I hadn't re -watch, I watched it in the theater like when it came out like twenty years ago. It's this movie, it's really back. It's Matt Damon, um, back when he was um, uh, it was like his first movie that he like wrote with like who's the other guy from Boston? That was like Batman that everyone Black hates. Black. Matt, yeah, Ben Affleck. So the two of them back when they were young, like twenty four year old like hotshots or whatever, were like shopping around the script and they were just like nobodies and then they got the script, they got it produced and they made it and they started it and they became famous. And anyway, it's all about this like misunderstood, like angry young man who's like a genius and blah 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 blah. But one of the things that happens is he's like it's like it's like ah cliche he's like a janitor in some college and he like walks into like some lecture hall and posed on the board in chalk MIT is it, is it at MIT okay it's at MIT and there's like some graph theory class going on or the, cl the class has ended and but was left up on the board uh, a graph theory problem which was posed as being like this incredibly hard problem and the problem is draw all homeomorphic trees with ten vertices or something like that something like that yeah and then he just like he stops his mopping and he gets out of chalk and he just answers it and the professor comes back the next day and he's like, who did this problem? You are a genius! And then he stops being a janitor and he becomes like a, like a math PhD student and then, you know, things like that happen. Alright, good! <laughs> Woo! Uh, go Google it, you can watch it, and there's a um, number file video where they just like do it really fast. It takes five minutes. Alright, um... <laughs> Planarity homework. How did that go? I'm gonna pretend everyone did it. Good. Let's let the record show in the video. People watching home that everyone in the room got out all their homework at this precise moment. The planarity homework was. I think I just gave you like a graph, man. And the gra and the question was like, is it planar? Is that true? Did anyone in this room do the homework that was due today? It was like a lot and it was hard. Okay, good. Okay, you should like make a mental note that you should do all this homework that was due today. It's like pretty hard and like important. All right, one of the problems that was due today was just, I think I gave you like either two or three problems that was just like, dude, what's up with this graph? Is it planar or not? Jenny, do you agree? Which was that number? I like already don't remember. Page 638, 6 and 7. 638, 6 and 7. Yeah, so is this graph, it is called like the spaceship graph or some crap like that. I think is the official name of it. And it's like, a, okay, this is going to take a long time to draw. But it's like A, B, F, H, J. Someone want to help? Um, like, draw this again? Yeah. Yeah, but like, um, you know. Yeah, that would be great. F, uh, H, J. I believe this is called the spaceship graph. I don't think I'm making that up. I think that's like a thing. Um, and now these are, so this is like an octagon essentially, but then also there are connections between like opposite uh, vertices and cha, but then also there are like four other points just like chilling out here, C, um, D, uh, L, and uh, K. And K is connected to like, G and J, 